Welcome to this open forum, which is part of the World Economic Forum. I gather some of you have, have uh, your buses arrived late, so I'm um, sorry if you're uh, filing in a little bit late, but if you could uh, find a seat, that would be great. Um, I'm Gideon Rachman, I work for the Financial Times. It's a great pleasure to be here in Dubai, and particularly here at the campus of the American University. Our topic today is one of the most urgent challenges facing the Middle East in particular. It's, it's this stuff, water and uh, water security. And we're fortunate to have some real experts on this subject from all over the world. Let me briefly introduce them to you. Uh, just next to me on my left is Margaret Catley Carlson, who's patron of the Global Water, water Partnership, which is a coalition of grassroots organizations. Uh, over at the end, we have Usha Rao Manari, who's head of water, global infrastructure, and natural resources at the International Finance Corporation. Next to her uh, is Rabi Mokhtar, who's director of the Global Engineering Program at the College of Engineering in Purdue University in the United States. And over here is Luis Echavari, director general at the OECD for the Nuclear Energy Agency. What, uh, I'll, let me just briefly ex explain the structure, because this is an open forum and we want all of you to participate. What we're going to do is each of our speakers will speak for about four minutes, just to give a a brief overview of the topic and their particular take on it. We'll then have a, a discussion moderated by me, and then we should have at least uh, half an hour, I hope a little bit more, for questions from you and, and discussion amongst the panel. Um, so to get us underway, and to give an overview of this topic of water security, Margaret, could I turn to you first? Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, can you hear me? Is this working about right? Yes? Yes, okay. I'm very glad to be here. I'm even more glad that you're here because uh, it's great to talk about water, but it's much better when you've got an audience that is very interested in this. Uh, my very happy task is to give you a kind of water 101 and to set the stage for discussing water in this region, and then it'll be picked up by some of our other panelists. So the, the, let's start with the absolute basics of water 101. First of all, you read in the newspapers all the time that the amount of water is decreasing. Well, in fact, we got the same amount of water we had when the dinosaurs were roaming around, the same amount when Hannibal was climbing over the Alps. We've got the same amount of water. What has happened is with population change and population movements and the uptake of water, there's not necessarily water in places that are convenient or places where human beings live. And so therefore, it is the human component in particular that has changed and the human use component in particular. So in this region where you've got 6% of the global population, you've only got 1% of the available water. And so even though we've got the same amount of water on the earth that we've always had, uh, that doesn't guarantee that everybody is close to a convenient supply of water. And that is particularly the case in this region uh, where the water challenges are among the most severe challenges that exist uh, for any of the global regions. Uh, this is a big region. When you look at the Middle East and North Africa, it varies from efficient agricultural producers off with uh, Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia, down to very efficient energy producers where we are now in the GCC, and efficient hydro producers if you include uh, Turkey and the North African era. So the, the energy and the agricultural profiles are very different across the region. Uh, it's very energy rich, you know that. It's also quite a good region in terms of the delivery of water services. Most of you know what the Millennium Development Goals are, and that's about how much water actually gets delivered to people and the sanitation services. This region gets generally a pretty high report card in the importance that you have ascribed to actually making water services available. So a high score in that area. Um, but you have within this region uh, the poster child for the country that makes uh, a living and manages to survive with the least amount of water per capita, and that's Jordan. Uh, and yet Jordan still has a pretty good service delivery record. So a high variety in the region in terms of agriculture, energy profiles, and certainly of water use. Globally, we make all over the world about 70% of water is used for agriculture. And the interesting part here is that even in this region, which is water challenged or water scarce, that same number hangs on. And even in Jordan, they've just now managed to get the amount of their water that they use from well over 80% down into the high 60s. 
And so the persistence of use of water in the agricultural area keeps on. Why? Because it's associated with employment, rural communities, et cetera. And that's a global situation that you find also in this region. Climate change is not kind to the MENA region. You've all seen that. You've seen the forecasts for uh, the, this region having even more acute water challenges. Uh, and in some senses, it's well equipped to meet these uh, in the sense that there are some rivers that flow and there's certainly the desalination option in this part of the MENA region. It's an option that has costs in terms of the greenhouse gas implications and in terms of what is done with the brine and with the after effects of desalination. And we're going to be talking, Louis Echeverria is going to take us through some of the energy impacts of water. So uh, this is um, uh, certainly a way of uh, getting water and having, having water available, but it's not without long-term costs. Water needs energy. You can't, unless you're standing beside a stream with your hands, uh, you need some kind of infrastructure to use water, whether it's a pipe, uh, whether it is uh, a, a storage capacity, whether you're gathering this up and putting it through, uh, a, a putting it through a water supply and water treatment plants, water needs energy to run. Energy needs water. You can't produce uh, oil and gas. Uh, you can't produce nuclear. You can't do the cooling tower stage of energy production without water. And so, therefore, <coughs> this relationship, which has when the world population was less, wasn't really a constraining relationship as we move into a more energy demanding world and a more food demanding world because of population increase, we're starting to create a situation where the energy needs for water are starting to be a constraint on economic growth in various regions. So I'm going to end with the idea uh, that two ideas. One of them is that all countries in the world are entering the stage where they're managing water in a kind of nexus. Imagine a triangle that looks like this. You've got water at one end of it, you've got agriculture down here, and you've got energy here. When we had fewer people in the world and fewer people in this region, when you used a lot in one of those corners, it didn't really make that much difference to the other. But as we move up towards 9 billion people, as the demands in each of those corners increase, when you pull at the energy end, you're having an impact on the water available for agriculture. When you add more for agriculture, you may be reducing the amount available for energy. And in any case, you're certainly changing the impact for the environment. So we're going to have to start looking in this region and in other regions at how we reduce the demand for water. And can we do this and still have comfortable lives, high agricultural yields, and the energy we need? I think we can, but it's going to involve some habit change. So I hope we can talk about that in the discussion period. Margaret, thank you, thank you very much for that admirably lucid, as you say, Water 101, for really setting the stage for us for the discussion today. Uh, I'd now like to turn to Rabbi Mokhtar, who I know uh, would like to expand on some of those themes. Thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure to share uh, some of the fear, some of the uh, what keeps me awake. Uh, so, uh, if uh, you dream about a dry, thirsty world uh, tonight, then we would have done our job, because really we should all be concerned. Uh, water security, as Margaret uh, talked about, it's at the core of our existence, especially in this region. Uh, so, I'd like to amplify on what Margaret uh, talked about, and I'd like to maybe highlight the, the, the issues in three different categories. Uh, the first would be location, the second is the governance, water governance, and the third is the uh, pop population or public. Uh, so starting with location, this region has been, you could say, fortunate, but I would say it's unfortunate that uh, we exist and 70% of the land that we, that in this region is, is a desert. Uh, so that's by, by, by definition, we are in an area that has water scarcity, uh, 13, out of the, uh, uh, nine, 13 out of the 19 driest areas on the world belong to the MENA region. So, so this gives you an idea of the extent of, of the problem. Uh, one third of our water resources in this region is coming from outside the region. An example would be uh, the Euphrates, 
and a bigger example that is now hitting a lot of the publicity and detention uh, is the Nile River, where it, it, it's a shared water resource, uh, let alone the problem that exists uh, in, in Palestine with, the, with all of the aquifers, uh, the, the east and, and the west aquifer, and the, 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 the shared water resources. So uh, th that's a huge issue when it comes to a, a, a region that has uh, already uh, uh, extreme scarcity. Uh, on average, now I don't want to talk about specifics, but on average in this region, we consume per capita one-tenth of what is consumed uh, uh, globally. Now, if you take regions like Gaza, uh, uh, that would be one, even one and a twentieth uh, percentage of what uh, is consumed globally. And as we are going into uh, uh, more and more resource-scarce water uh, 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 environment, that figure is becoming it's setting to a point that is, is, is hitting the health, the hygiene, the, the uh, basic requirement for, for, uh, for survival. Uh, let alone what we are experiencing, at least uh, in the models that are predicting global change, we are going to be experiencing even more severe uh, impact of, of that water scarcity. And that is, is coming into shifting our eco zones and the, the desertification that's already uh, happening. Uh, so if I shift to the uh, governance of water, and, and I would say the lack of governance of water, I would like to build on what, uh, what Margaret mentioned, which is the uh, water energy food nexus. Our governments uh, are lacking in terms of the institutional uh, way of integrating water policy and water demand management, where we look at the water as the core driver for our, for, for our economy. I'm sure we are gonna be talking about this uh, a little bit more, uh, but, but water as the core of our existence, at the core of our e economy, and yet we develop water policies and we develop food policy and we develop strategies for energy and energy security independently. So one of the uh, lack of governance that I would say, uh, beside the, the, the corruption, beside the, the issues that we may or may not be uh, talk about today, I would say there is a structural gap that we need to fill which is our ability to put all the stakeholders on the same table so that we can discuss security of water and the future of the existence of, of this region. Uh, so let alone we do have a poor water management, we have, uh, we have not uh, been able to reach the users, uh, as our friend uh, Tony, the farmers. Uh, Maggie shared a, 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 a very significant uh, statistics globally uh, about 71% of our fresh water resource goes into food production. If you go to the MENA region, that figure goes up to 85%. Mm. So 85% of the water is going to food production, and yet the farmers who are consuming that water are not on the table when decisions on integrated water management are being set. So we need to bring them in, and they need to be an integral part of the uh, governance of, of water. Uh, public awareness about water use is not, is not there. Uh, that needs to be uh, uh, there uh, as well. And uh, last but not least in this issue, which is a debatable issue, especially in, in our region, uh, is water pricing. There's a value that we set to water. Water should be a commodity. It should not be a commodity that's, that's marketable. It's a, it's a free, uh, everybody should have the right to access to a clean water. However, uh, the, the, the other side of the coin, when you're looking at anything that's free is waste. And unless we really reach a stage where we start regulating and pricing water appropriately, uh, then we won't be able to, to, uh, to reach a, a, a security uh, for that important resource. An example would be uh, in the trade issue, if you buy, I just give the, this example, have you thought that most of the money you pay for this bottle of water is not for the water itself, it's for the infrastructure that supports the bottling and the industry that goes beyond that. And that's a question I'd like you to be thinking of. Uh, that's not goes only to the, to the water bottle, but it goes to the many of the commodities. Uh, the, the water pricing for, every com for any commodity that we have is a very, very small percentage of the production cycle. Right. And, and I'm not pro proposing increasing food prices, but, uh, but this is something. Uh, now, the third is the population. Uh, we do have a stress in population growth. We do have a stress when it comes to the efficiency of using our water resources. If you look at the water scarce region, our global water use efficiency is 45%, uh, sorry, 30% as compared to 45% globally. So why would regions that have a lot of water, abundance of water, have a higher water use efficiency than this region 
that has a water scarcity issue. Uh, seawater intrusion, over pumping, all of that is a, are critical issues that the public needs to be aware of and they need to regulate their, uh, their, their consumption. Okay, Ravi, thank you, thank you very much for uh, a really interesting presentation with some very sobering statistics in there. You mentioned pricing and, and obviously finance and is, is a big part of this, this whole issue of management and fortunately we have an expert on that as our next speaker. So Usha Raumanari, can I hand over to you now? Thank you, Gideon, and it's a real pleasure to be here with all of you. I'm looking out across the hall and I see a lot of young people here and I hope that at least some of the messages that we put forward are things that resonate with you and you'll take forward with you and become a new breed of water thinkers and water managers as you go forward. On the issue of finance, and I'd like to pick up a little bit on what Maggie and Ravi have spoken about so far. This region has pretty unique characteristics when it comes to water sources, so where you get the water from and how the water is used. Some of it has been already described in terms of how high agricultural water use is, for example. But let's take a step back. This region has three sources of water that I can see. One, surface water, or rivers and lakes and so on, wherever they exist. There's enormous amounts of groundwater or underground aquifers. Most of them, if not all of them, are non-renewable. That means once you use them once, it, there's nothing else to renew it. There's no more water you can put back into it. And third, desalination. This is one region that has used desalination as a base capacity source of water more than anywhere else in the world. And why is that? Principally because you have a good source and a cheap source of energy. Because desalination has two characteristics, well, three, uh, based on what Maggie said. One, it's highly initially capital intensive, so large amounts of money to build a desal plant, right? Second, it takes a lot of energy to run it. So if you have an, a, a plant that produces water for 25 years, you need 25 years of a good source of energy. And third, there are sort of environmental uh, issues related to it, GHG emissions, brine in the water and so on, environmental issues that you have to be careful of, but which the region has been dealing with and has been, has been managing so far. Other parts of the world, if, I'm, if I may look at other parts of the world, don't have desalination as an option because they don't have the cheap energy. And they've decided that yes, we would use desalination only for extra water needs, so peaking water needs as opposed to base water needs. Right? And the way the region has financed it is completely using public finance. The government has financed most of the desalination capacity that it has. In the last few years, if you look at it, the government has said, we'd like to bring the private sector into this desalination sector. And they have done so by offering various sorts of financial structures, financial packages to finance some of these integrated water and power plants, as they're called, IWPPs. And you've seen a lot of the water companies come in and, and, and participate, water and power companies come in and participate. I think though, when you do produce desalinated water, and if your other two sources are fairly scarce, as Rabi was pointing out, you have the, both the underground water and the surface water scarce, you have to be uh, careful that you use the water carefully and you use it sensibly and efficiently. What I think we said so far is that there is overuse and overabstraction of water, and the way we use it in the region, or you use it in the region, is not efficient. So for example, if you look at city networks, water networks in cities, the wastage and loss in city ne networks is as high as about 50%. That means every drop of water that is produced through expensive desalination, for example, goes through a system where half a drop is, goes out of the pipes into the ground. It never gets to your taps. It never gets to the industry that needs it, et cetera, or even agriculture that needs it. So that's one big thing. Second, as I think Ravi pointed out, the per capita water use on average in this region is quite high compared to other regions. So there are some countries in this region that have a per capita water consumption of 500 cubic meters. I want you to compare this to the United States, which has about 600 or 625 or something like that. That's pretty high in a very, very water scarce uh, region. So I guess. Where I'm, I'm, I'm coming with this is simply to pick up on a point that I think Maggie made. Really important to worry about the demand side of the sector. It's not enough to worry about where you get the water from. It's also important to worry about how we use the water. And demand side interventions, including reduction of demand in general, is something that is going to become characteristic, in my view, in this region as we go forward. 
This is not unlike other parts of the world. Scarcity is driving many other countries of the world to worry about demand and demand efficiencies and demand management, not only in our consumption, industrial consumption, and particularly agricultural consumption. So I'm going to stop there uh, and, and, and let uh, Let's move to, to, to Luis. Luis. Uh, Thank you very much. Bang on five minutes. Uh, that was great. Um, Luis Echevarri is our last speaker. And some of you may be uh, wondering, why do we have an expert on nuclear energy and a discussion on water? <laughs> he's got the wrong. He's wandered in off the, <laughs> the street, and he's just in the wrong place. No, there is, in fact, a very important connection between energy and water. And Luis will now explain it. OK, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity of being uh, with you uh, here today. This is extremely important, more than you think. It's because people of our generations uh, have taken maybe some decisions in the past, but the decision for the future lay in your hands. So you are key for what is going to happen with the planet in the future and with the region. So this is very important. But all the speakers have already uh, mentioned uh, energy, uh, because, of course, energy is an important part of any discussion on water. I am personally in the Council on Energy Security, but logically there is a close connection with the Council on Water Security. There is a close interrelationship, as we have seen already, between energy and water. To produce energy, you need water, a lot of water. But also to produce water, you need energy. You can produce water with energy. But to use the water, also you need energy to transport and, and to use it. So that interrelation, I think, is extremely important. And uh, this is the reason why we have to work together. Well. The main thing uh, when you produce energy, especially power, is that most of the resources that we have today, we provide most of the energy and the power consuming the world, uh, need a lot of uh, water. Either it, they are uh, coal uh, uh, plants or oil plants or gas, nuclear, even renewables. When you have uh, thermosolar, you need also, because you need water to produce the steam which moves uh, the turbines. So that's very important. And you can listen or you can see the statistics and you will see that the utilization of water by from energy is very high, could be 30, 40 percent in an industrialized country. Yes, but this is the utilization. And th the first message here, which is very important, is that that is not the consumption of water. Energy needs a lot of water, but gives back also a lot of water. To give you a, a data on that, in a country like the United States, which is very industrialized and has consumes a lot of energy, the consumption of water in the energy sector, in the power sector, sorry, in the electricity sector, is about 3%. Nuclear there is 20%. If you look at France, another industrialized country, in other regions of the world where nuclear is 78%, you will see that also the consumption of water from the power industry is only 3%. So this is a figure that you can keep in mind. Energy utilizes a lot of water, but gives back also a lot of water. Well, what about nuclear? Well, nuclear is becoming important, especially in this region, because uh, the recent decisions uh, led by uh, high prices of oil on the one hand, but also the need to combat climate change. Nuclear doesn't produce CO2 in operation. So it's becoming very attractive to the point that Abu Dhabi has decided, as you know, to build uh, now four nuclear power plants. Well, these uh, nuclear power plants are going to be uh, needing uh, a, lot of en a lot of water, of course. But, uh, you know, normally you place uh, nuclear power plant uh, logically when you have enough water. But it could be either in the seashore or in land. If it's in land, you have a good river uh, to, uh, to, to have uh, fresh water. And if the river is not good enough, you need a calling tower. But I think in this region, the most attractive thing, logically, is to use the water from the sea and then to give it back to the sea. So I think from that point of view, I think you can make compatible the access to, a, for example, a nuclear energy with a rational use of water. Of course, logically, uh, the fact of utilizing uh, seawater, which corrodes more some uh, material, will have some impact in the, in the initial cost of installation. But I think uh, that this could be very well assumed by the, by the final cost of the kilowatt hour. So I think from that point of view, uh, as it happens with other, uh, especially uh, thermal uh, plants uh, with uh, coal on, or, or gas in many areas, including, including oil, I think that nuclear is not detrimental to that. 
I think you can combine an efficient way of uh, uh, producing uh, nuclear electricity with a rational utilization of water from the sea. You don't need to desalinize that water. Eh? Of course, you have to have conducts which are resistant to the corrosion of the sea water, which add some cost to that. But I think you can uh, make that uh, compatible. But in the good sense, in the good side also, is that nuclear power plants produce a lot of electricity. You know, they operate more than 7,000 hours a year, and they produce a lot of electricity. Again, this electricity could be used for uh, desalination. And uh, with some technologies, also the steam could be used for desalination. So I think from that point of view, there is a coupling between the production of electricity from nuclear with the fact of making more water available. Okay. So I think that uh, following the trend which happens in the, in the world very recently, especially driven by energy security and climate change, nuclear could be a very attractive option. Okay. Louis, thank you very much indeed for... Uh explain what is something that had always baffled me, which is why is oil-rich Abu Dhabi building nuclear power stations? Um, I've got a question, actually, for, for, for each of you, based on what, what you had to say. Um, if, if I could start with you, Usha. Um, you made quite a strong point that de demand management has to be part of the solution. Again, you know, as an outsider, both to the region and to this subject, it strikes me, I arrive here from Europe, where we're, we're all going bankrupt. They seem to, be, seem to have lots of money here. Uh, the Gulf states are rich, Saudi Arabia is rich. Uh, okay, desalination is expensive, but isn't this just a problem that they, they might be able to solve just by throwing money at it? So you can throw money at problems, and many times they get fixed. The thing about this region and the subject of water in this region is that every move you make has a knock-on effect. And you have to be careful about that knock-on effect. So the region it has enough money to say, well, I'm just going to do desalination. And I'm going to just throw a whole bunch of money at desalination. And I don't have to worry about anything. The worry there is an environmental one. But more importantly, it's a use of energy one. Because the region doesn't have static population growth or static urbanization or static anything or food needs. So all these things have to be taken into account. And if all the energy, let's pretend, is being used for desalination, then other needs or other uses of energy won't get as much. It's a bit like the nexus that both Mag Maggie and Rabbi talked about, which is today in a resource-scarce world, or increasingly resource-scarce world, we have to worry about knock-on effects of taking an action. So to your question, can you throw money at desal? You can, but there will be knock-on effects. Should you throw money at demand management? In my view, you should, and there's not enough money being thrown at it. There has to be a more structured and systematic view taken of demand management in the region in all of its uses. And I think that will be a good use of money, and the knock-on effects may be less. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Okay. Now, these phrases, demand management, and, and I want to pick up on a phrase that Margaret used, uh, changing habits. I mean, I think that they may sometimes set off alarm bells in people's minds. You know, well, what, you know, what do you mean when you want to manage my department? What habits do you, do you want me to change? And again, to give you a kind of example, I've just come from one of the lovely hotels they have here in Dubai, and there didn't seem to be, much, nobody seemed to be changing their habits or managing their demand very much. You know, there was a swimming pool, there were showers everywhere. Are these the kind of lifestyle choices that people are going to have to change? Or given that, as you said, 70% of the water is, is actually going on agriculture, are, are, these, are those sort of lifestyle issues not really relevant? Are we talking essentially about agriculture? How do you do demand management? Well, um, there's the three R's to start off with, which is reduce, recycle, reuse. So that's one of the ways that you can do demand management. You reduce the amount of water that is used in industries, including hotels. Uh, you reduce them by ways like such as only changing the sheets once every one day, using less water for car washes, uh, all sorts of small measures, but that absolutely add up. In industry, you reduce them in very important ways by putting in continuous loop systems so that no industry, the particularly industries that put pollution into uh, the outflow, uh, is either polluting or adding to its water bill. In other words, an industry uh, that requires a lot of water 
uh, simply puts in a continuous loop system so that they clean their own water and, re and use it again. That's a demand management measure because from that point on, that industry is not using new water. Uh, the, in Australia, some because they've just had seven years of drought and so there's a lot they could teach all of us, but particularly this region. Uh, and they're not going to suffer a lot. Australians aren't in the business of suffering. And so, therefore, uh, this, this is something useful to actually go and take a look at. Some of the cities and the new subdivisions that are being built in Australia have cut by 80% their demand for new water coming into the community. Now, what does this mean? It means that they have reduced their processes within the city that actually call for water. They are recycling that water. And that doesn't mean that you recycle all water that is being used, but you can certainly recycle some water. There's now a building in New York that uh, recycles most of its water. In other words, you do some separation uh, of water that's coming in, and then you clean your gray water, uh, and you reuse the gray water. You might put it through a reed bed, or through a biological functioning, then you reuse it again. Mm. So reduce means you change the system and the way you use it. Recycle means you think of what other use could be made of that water, and then you reuse it. And the thing about reuse is that you get water fit for purpose. So I love the example in San Diego, for example, in Orange County in the United States. They, re they clean and then they reuse their wastewater, all of their wastewater. And sometimes it goes back in the river, sometimes it's used for agriculture, sometimes it goes back in the aquifer, and they basically have a dial, which is very clean, not so clean, a little bit clean, and clean enough. And you only use the energy that, y it's a little more sophisticated than I'm telling you, but basically you only use the amount of energy that you need to clean it to the next purpose for the water use. Yeah. So when you reduce, reuse, and recycle, you don't apply the same energy all the time. You don't always clean water up to drinking water level. This is one of the things that bothers me in this region, is that when you, you do reuse your water and you recycle it sometimes too, uh, in horticulture, in boulevards, in agriculture, in places like this, but when you clean it, you clean it up to pr virtually drinking water standard. The rose bushes are not that fussy, you know. I don't mm. think there should be rose bushes either. But, uh, but the point is that when you're doing demand management, you do it through thinking through, okay, what's, what's the next purpose for this water and how much do I clean it? You so those are the three R's. You make it all sound kind of painless, that it's just a question of being a bit more efficient and so on. Is that the case? Because, I mean, even in, you know, rainy England, every now and then we run short of water, there's a hot summer, and then you actually get asked to do things that people don't want to do, like, you know, stop, don't, wa don't water your garden, don't wash your car. Are those the kind of lifestyle changes, or is that just a a symptom of inefficiency that we can, we can get round by adopting these three R's that you mentioned? Well, you usually have to do some investment first. Uh, but if you do it properly, the impact on people's lives is minimized. It's not, it's not reduced. It's not n eliminated. But it can be, it can be minima minimalized. But it does take some investment first. It's like my industrial example. When you put in your continuous loop system, the initial investment may be really quite expensive. But then the over the amortization cost or the running out cost of this over the years, uh, that company isn't having to buy fresh water anymore. Mm -hmm. And so therefore it can subtract from its running costs the costs that, uh, the necessary costs, and here I offer, I uh, echo Usha that if, and, and Rabi that uh, companies should be paying for water uh, because water is a free good, but the pipes, the containers, the cement, uh, and the staff that run it are not free goods. Uh, so therefore, they're getting, they're cutting into their own future running cost, which is a good thing. So, mm. is it painless? No. Uh, can it be made as um, painless as possible? Yes, with a great deal of thinking. So, okay. you need more people around the table than just your water department to start doing this. By the way, everybody in a society needs to agree. Okay, we're going to reduce, we're going to recycle, and we're going to uh, reuse. Okay, Rabbi, uh, I mean. My experience sort of following a variety of political issues is that very often these kind of long-term things that experts can agree is a problem. People just let them roll on until they reach a crisis point and then, and then you get the momentum for action. So give us an idea of what, what happens here in the Middle East if it's just business as usual, if nobody pays any attention to, to people like you for a while. Do you at some point hit a crisis and what would that crisis look like? We're already at a crisis. 
uh, in the next 15 years, we are, we are in need of 50% in this region. Globally, it's about, the water gap is about 40%. We don't have exact statistics for this region, but projection is that we need to come up with 50% more fresh water with business as usual. I'd like to pick up on a couple of the points. If 85% of the water, fresh water, is used for agriculture, what Maggie is saying is absolutely right. But I would, I would challenge us to go to the bigger challenge, which is let us improve our water use efficiency for food production. If this region is water thirsty, and we are the least water use efficient for food production. I mean, I shared earlier statistics. Globally, the water use efficiency is 45%. In this region, it's 30%. Why? Why can't we bridge that gap? If 85% if 85 of our fresh water resource, so as a policymaker, yes, I would go to, to the three R's. It's very important to engage the public. But to, do the, the be, to have the best savings for my, for my investment, I would, I would go back after the, after the food. I mean, th this is a very sensitive issue, I understand. There are subsistence farming. There are a lot of political implications to that. But this is where the biggest chunk is, is hitting. So to answer your, your question, we are already we are already at a red zone. I mean, if you look at any statistics, any way you want to look at it, we are at the crisis. And I'd like, I mean, Usha put, pointed out a very important issue. We can pump water into it. Remember, this is a desert environment. Desert environments are very vulnerable. We are already at a threshold in losing biodiversity. And, and I, I, would, I would actually, Luis mentioned a very good point. Yes, we are only at 3% in the US in terms of water consumption for energy. But we have to remember that there is a, not only the consumption part, there is also the water quality none of us has mentioned. Water quality is a big issue. So if you look at the over fertilization and the, the, the nitrogen and the phosphorus that is in our surface water, I can give you examples. We did a study a few years ago in Lebanon. Oh, that was a few years ago, and I would say that today the, 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 the statistics are even more haunting. All of the water that's, that's above or, or below 500 meters is polluted. Why? It's all polluted because of agriculture. It's polluted because of sanitation. So we need to be looking at not only water is a vague, vague term. We have to define it. Water that is pure water 500 meters below, sea, sea, uh, below groundwater is not the same water as I have it here in my... my so there's an energy implication. There's a water quality. There's a different levels, as, as Maggie mentioned. Why do I have to? Why I do have to have a pure water used for, for domestic uses? If I can, so so we, are we ready to have our revamped in, in, the, in the entire infrastructure and have two sets of water uh, systems? One that's used for flushing the toilet. Other one is used for for drinking. Why not? Okay. Luis, uh, listening to all of your presentations, it struck me that yours is probably the most optimistic in the sense that you saw something positive happening in the, in the development of nuclear energy. But what other things can happen in, in the energy sector that can, can help with this problem, with the water problem? Well, <coughs> uh, logically, as I said, uh, energy is a mechanism uh, to produce water, apart from uh, having the possibility of helping in the utilization of water. I think and the water is scarce here. You can transform, as you are doing with the desalination plants, you can transform energy in water. But the energy consumption of the coming years is going to be impressive. This area is going to be developed, energy as a base of the economical development. You can expect in the next 20, 25 years an increase of more than 50% of the demand of energy. So the things that, that you have to do is to do, it, to do that in an efficient way that you utilize less and less energy for the same purpose. In that field, I think nuclear has a benefit, is that nuclear can only be used for the production of electricity. It's not useful, uranium is not useful for any other thing. Okay. So nuclear is an additional uh, source of uh, electricity which can help in producing water. So I think from that point of view, I think it's very attractive uh, in the future, and this is why many countries are coming back to nuclear, because this big demand of energy in the coming years. Okay. Uh, before I, I'll take some questions from the audience just in just a minute, but Usha, I saw you kind of wanting to intervene a couple of times during Margaret's presentation. I just, I just wanted to go back to your point on, or your question on, look, what is demand management? How do you do it and how do you achieve it? Is it just lifestyle changes and so on? It is all of that. And I think what Maggie said is absolutely right. Oh, there, there will be lifestyle changes, but I'd like to leave on the table something 
that hasn't explicitly been mentioned, which is simply that if a resource, if you, not a resource, if anything is valued and has a price attached to it, you're careful about how you use it. Water, over time, uh, historically, has never in my mind been valued properly. That doesn't mean a profit-making price, which is kind of what is always thrown at it. Oh, you can't price water because it's a fundamental human right. It is a fundamental human right. But in order to make it, make people understand the value of it or any other resource, there has to be a value attached. So my answer to that would be, many countries of the world are finally now realizing that water is finite, it's not infinite, and water is being overused, it's not being properly used, so how do we change the use? And so they're trying to think about value structures around water that do bring out and bring about the behavioral and lifestyle changes and choices that we were talking about a second ago. Okay. So I just wanted to put that on the table. Right. And last question before I turn to the audience. Um, Ravi, uh, you know, when I've looked at this issue in, in a sort of political context in other regions, Certainly, between India and China, there's, there's water is an issue because of the, the the question of the Himalayas and the, both looking for the same sources of scarce water. Give us an idea of the geopolitics of water here in this region. You mentioned it's an issue in in, in the search for a Middle East peace settlement with with the Palestinians and the Israelis, both you know after the same scarce resource. And and is there a broader geopolitical issue here here in in, in the Middle East? Absolutely. I mean, I, I would even uh, say the, the more kind of a, uh, a silent bomb that's waiting to explode is the, is the Nile River, uh, which is, I think is a much more severe problem that, that uh, we need to be paying more attention to it. Uh, at, at the core of the problem is that population growth, the, the demand f for water from all the sectors, as we, as we spoke about. I mean, agriculture is the, is the largest, second largest is energy, industry, and domestic use. All of them are competing for a scarce water resource. And, and we don't have yet a, a, uh, an, an agreed upon policy. Uh, Transboundary water issues is a huge issue. And, and well, when you say the Nile, because essentially various countries, Sudan, Egypt. So, so Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt, uh, of course. The, so, so who owns the water is a big question. Mm -hmm. The water value. Uh, uh, so civilization was, was, was actually established in the, in the Nile River in the premise that, yes, the delta in the, in the Egypt uh, region uh, owns the water, but what about up, upstream? So would, would uh, Sudan, if they want to develop their, I mean, they're, they're talking about massive industrial uh, agricultural growth in those areas, building dams in Ethiopia. So is that uh, going to, I mean, what's the implication of those on the downstream water use? Uh, we have not, I mean, I'm sure there are lots of discussions, but a lot of those discussions behind the scene. And, and those are issues that we are going to be confronting. Uh, I'll give you an example of a successful mediation from the, uh, uh, in the, in the uh, United States. Uh, the, the city of Phoenix is negotiating with Los Angeles to build their desalination plant on the Pacific, while the city of uh, the Los Angeles would, would yield some of the water from the, from the Colorado River, uh, uh, give their portion, because it's easier, less energy intensive, for, for, the, for, for the Phoenix uh, area to get direct water from the, from the river. So those negotiations are ongoing, and I think we will be uh, 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 having a much growing demand for water diplomacy. How do we conflict res resolution in this area? I think there's a lot of work to be done, and examples are, are numerous in, in, uh, globally. Okay. Just especially in the cycle period, yeah. we're yeah. a lot in this region. Yeah. Okay, good, thank you very much. Now. Uh, other questions from the audience? If you could just uh, stick your hand up, um, and there's a microphone somewhere. Yeah, gentleman over here. Yeah, just one question here. Uh, the, is the mic working? Do you want to just? Uh, I think he'll, he'll, he should give you a hand just to check it's working. Yeah, that sounds right. As we know that whenever there is an resource, the resource is always in uh, an increase. It does not uh, decrease. One of them is underground waters. Now. Um, Actually, in this region, the underground water level it's, it's decreasing time by a time by a time. And that has been used because of certain manufacturers like producing bottled waters are using these kind of resources to produce pure water. And uh, due to the nature of our region, we have limited uh, rain, raining and the winters. So we are looking here that certain resources are being taken 
by s private sectors and how we can go and prevent that because within the coming 10 years, we can say that the underground water will be less than even we can use it in our own farms. Okay, so thanks. I, I, I should have asked, could you just say who you are? It's always interesting for the panel. If you, uh, well, uh, uh, my name is Suleiman and uh, I am working in one of the government sectors. Just to ask questions because actually before two months we were sitting, me and certain of my friends, and actually they had a farm and they said the underground water which was under their farm has been gone yeah. hmm. somehow. So uh, we came to that discussion saying that who is taking that water and where is it going? Because before five years ago or seven years ago, it was, uh, it was there and it was, uh, the level of it, it was very high. They can use it for the coming 10, 15 years. But within seven years, it's all been taken. Okay, is there any, anybody want to, to, to take that? From Margaret, I yeah. can start on that one. Groundwater around the world has been the, the great invisible and great neglected resource because countries have pretended that this almost was a separate source of water, almost as if it came from the moon, instead of uh, being intimately connected with other sources of water. I mean, if you take out all your groundwater, you suddenly find that your rivers and your lakes, if you have them, are behaving very differently. And in your case, as you say, you're taking away r water that may not even be renewable. And it's a, it's a one-time use, and so it really has to be looked at very carefully indeed. But this is a global problem. Uh, we have lacked the ability to do a lot of the uh, scoping, a lot of the monitoring. Many, many countries have not put up regulations, and where they have, they haven't then monitored them, and they haven't actually taken the legal measures to stop this. So uh, it's happened in this region, yes, but I mean, you should not think you're alone. India is the prime example of this, because six, 30 years ago, India couldn't feed itself. And so the, and it lived on a lot of food aid, and the government said, right, we'll make electricity free, and we'll make the water free. And so guess what? They really did solve the food production problem. And India is now a net food exporter. But guess what? They've got a tremendous problem because the water level in many parts of India is going down, down, down. And uh, one of the estimates has been that we've got the equivalent, we've got about 10% of all cereal production in the world that is being pr produced through unsustainably pumped groundwater. So what you're putting your finger on is a really serious issue. The answers to it is that public authorities have to take this issue much more seriously. There has to be a lot more transparency in allowing the licenses uh, for groundwater extraction. There has to be monitoring, and there has to be some public accountability about what the results of that monitoring are about, because there's no magic solutions. Uh, it's easier when the groundwater is being refilled and replenished by the natural force of rainfall, rivers, etc. Uh, particularly where this is not the case, that it can get very serious. But there's no substitution for a licensing arrangement which is known and which is monitored and which is, uh, which is, is gone after. Very interesting to hear, hear, hear you talk about the potential problems in India because one of the themes of this uh, World Economic Forum that we've, we've been having over the last few days is everyone's very excited about the emergence of India and China and so on. But one wonders whether water might be a constraint on Indian growth. and. Uh, I remember the last time I was in China, we were discussing this perennial question of, you know, what might trigger political change in China? And somebody said to me, well, things will change when people turn on the taps in Beijing and no water comes out, and then people really will get angry, and the groundwater is apparently disappearing. under The, the permanent secretary of India has just said out loud that the greatest constraint to Indian growth in the next decades is water, and that if Indians don't start paying for water, this is going to actually cost them in GNP growth. So that's about as large and uh, as direct a statement as, uh, as it's possible to make. Okay, next question. The gentleman in the, in the front row here. Good afternoon. My name is Mario Rodai. I'm the managing director of DHI. Can you hear me? Yep. Now. That's now better, yeah. yeah. So again, uh, Mario Rodai, the managing director at DHI. Uh, I don't know where to start. I actually have a question for each one of the panelists. I, I really appreciate you being here today, and uh, uh, it's a wealth of information that is being shared in a very short time. And um, I, am I am I okay? Just throwing a question at yeah, each yeah. person. Yeah, throw, okay. throw out four questions, right. and if you let's see what happens. Be, I'll just right. encourage them to answer them. In well, briefly. Margaret mentioned that um, Jordan, uh, being from Jordan, I appreciate that uh, statement is is a poster child for how to survive essentially with 
very little water. And uh, Ms. Uh, Rao Munari was uh, talking about demand management. So I'd like to uh, uh, pose the question to you or pose a question to you, how uh, do you manage demand in a place that doesn't have much? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a major challenge how to manage your uh, resource when you have very little of it. So that's a question for you. Should I continue and uh, then Yeah, if you, if you make them short and to the point, that'd be great. Okay, sure. And the, uh, the other question is, uh, well, it's, it's more of a note maybe to Mr. Muhtar, is to elaborate a little bit more on a very, very important point that you were the only one to bring up, which is IWRM, Integrated Water Resource Management, is very important and uh, not, not done uh, broadly in this region. So if you just educate us uh, a little more on that, maybe in a couple of minutes. Um, to Margaret, wise use of capital. Uh, we've got some major uh, water schemes uh, happening when in fact we can uh, put less money on reducing uh, non-revenue water uh, rather than spending a billion dollar on uh, a transmission line. Are we wiser spending half of that on reducing our non-revenue water? Uh, finally, uh, to uh, uh, the nuclear uh, side is uh, uh, in a region like the Middle East, uh, should we look at solar, PV, uh, equally as much as we're looking at uh, nuclear as a source for energy, especially serving water? That's Thanks all. for Thank for excellent Thank questions, uh, Luis. Do, do you want to do you want to start? Uh, yes, it does seem fairly obvious. There seems to be a lot of sun. Why don't they go for solar? Well, uh, let me say something. First, I think we need all energies. So really, energy is going to be scarce in the, in the future. So we need all of them. But each of them is different, and you have to use the ones which for you could be more attractive at the moment on time. Of course, this is a very solar region. My country, Spain, is also a very relatively solar region. So solar, it is very attractive. But the problem is that the technologies of today mean that the cost of a kilowatt hour is more than 10 times the average of the other resources. And that's a fact, because at the same time, you need capital, you need resources. So you have to balance the attractiveness of having a renewable energy which is local, like solar, with the economical effort that you have to make to make it available. And at this moment, uh, unfortunately, for example, wind power is only double than the average of the other. It has improved significantly in the last 10 years, but solar still is uh, around, let's say, 10 times uh, the cost okay. of kilowatt hour. Right. So you have to balance those things. I right. want to be next so I can disagree with them. Uh, <laughs> all right, this is <laughs> disagree, and that, disagree briefly, and then also answer the other question that I asked okay. you about capital. Morocco is moving up to about 40% of all of their use being solar. Uh, there are more and more efficient terms of non-efficient, uh, of more, more and more efficient examples of using or blending new forms of energy. Uh, Australia is putting in 3D cell plants and all three of them have a partial use of non-traditional energy in there, either solar or wave. One of them is going to be energy neutral in the sense of enough solar to add to the grid and then take it back from the grid in a downtime. So um, uh, look, that was spoken. I might, I might let Luis do one, do one sentence response to that. Uh, all right. He's speaking like a traditional energy manager, which is looking at today's prices for these things. I demand that we look at non-traditional energy through a slightly different lens. Well, I think we have to be in the business of reality, <laughs> and you can think about the future. The reality <laughs> the is that is uh, real too. Uh, my country, Spain, is a pioneer in solar. Solar is only 1% of the total output, so we need a lot of other things. And as I say, solar is living because it has huge subsidies from the government. Can I it's perhaps try and money. arbitrate the dispute and say it may be the solution in the future and we shouldn't stop looking at it, but for the moment it, it can't be. How do you be. get to the future unless you invest in it today? I'm not arguing against investment, okay. and it, but, but, uh, which brings us to neatly to capital. Right. What exactly. should we be spending well, money Well, and on? I want to answer the Jordan yeah. question. First of all, you say, okay, how can Jordan have options when it has so little? Uh, what are Jordan's chief exports to Europe? Cucumbers. What is cucumber? It's a package of water wrapped in a green skin. Uh, so if you are exporting cucumbers to uh, Europe uh, for the European restaurant tables, you're exporting water. Now that may be a good thing if it has an employment and a tax benefit. If it doesn't have an employment and a tax benefit, then a great deal of your water is walking out the door. It's actually not, it's flying out the door because the cucumbers get there by air. Uh, but uh, when you start looking at 
uh, demand management, you've got to look at things like your export patterns and whether this is actually suiting your country and not just the person that is exporting the um, packages of water wrapped in green skins. Margaret, uh, I could listen I to you all day, but it would be unfair on the other panelists. Right. So, uh, uh, yeah. And okay. that I wasn't even the question you asked me. Uh, <laughs> add to what Maggie just said. To your I happen to be working in Jordan and, and I know the water sector a little bit. You're right. Uh, Jordan is different from other countries in the region to the extent that it is truly water stressed in the sense of not having just enough of the resource, right? But that doesn't mean, though, that water is being very, very efficiently used. One example is, where is it being used? So cucumbers was something Maggie said. The other thing is, in your cities, which is kind of where we're working, there is large loss in the networks. And so when the government sits, the water minister, who I met a couple of weeks ago, says, I need to worry about water sources because there are no water sources and we're landlocked, almost landlocked, and so we can't do desal plants all over the place. How will I get water? We have that conversation, but then I never forget to say, please, when you do put in place this expensive water source infrastructure, don't forget about whether or not you're losing it in your systems, whether it's an agricultural system growing cucumbers or whether it is cities like Amman and some of your other secondary cities where the losses are very high still. They're between 50 and 70%. Yeah. Okay. Um, you were, uh, Rabbi, you were asked a question. We could talk a lot about the integrated water management, but uh, I'd, l I'd like to point out the flip side of, of the, of the uh, uh, issue with virtual water, uh, and that builds into the global water security for Jordan. 90% of waters, the demand for water in Jordan is imported through food. So that cannot be ignored. So as a hydrologist, we need to be actually re-educating our future generation about hydrology. And the biggest part of the in the dry land hydrology is what's imported in and out, what's traded. And that's, that's a big missing gap in, in our understanding of the, of the water flow, both locally and, and, and globally. Now, your, your comment about the integrated water management, we could, we could go on and on, but I'd like to pick up a few things. You drive down to the, to the Gore area and you see bananas plantation. Uh, uh, who's making those decisions? So we need to be looking at the global water use efficiency. What is native? What is appropriate to plant? What's, what, what, what the cropping pattern, cropping system, uh, irrigation efficiencies? And we need to be going beyond what's mine and what's yours and look at the watershed management plan and, and look at upstream areas, downstream areas, and where is the water use efficiency, not at the farm level, and uh, maybe at the, at the watershed level, and, and start planning at that, at that scale. Okay, uh, further questions? Yes, uh, maybe over here. Hello, uh, my name is Maggie Stasso. I'm a media student here at AUD. Um, what we're discussing today is extremely important, and we were actually discussing it in some of our classes and we were saying that uh, one of the reasons why this region is considered to be one of the top users of energy and water is because of fountains and water parks. So I want to know how bad it really is. And I think it's, they're harder to recycle because they've got lots of chemicals. So that's one thing. And another thing, I want to point out that I think one of the reasons why we use lots of water here is because we don't have uh, rules or laws that abide us from doing so. Um, maybe if we, ha we knew that we had a limit, each household ha can use only that, we will stop. For example, when I go to Jordan in the summer and my cousins uh, who all go there from different countries, uh, from Gulf countries, uh, because we know that uh, we don't have much water there, we limit our usage of water so much. And it really it makes a difference. And it, it's, um, it's a proof that we are capable of u uh, using less water. So my question is here, are there countries around the world that have uh, rule, rules that limit the usage, usage of water? Not only because they don't have, but because they want to control. Okay, so that's a very good question. And Thank I, you I very must much. say, it, was it only now strikes me as slightly odd that when I arrived at my hotel, the first thing they said is, and the water park's just down the road, and you know, you can go there, but. Uh, it, yeah. I'm gonna take a first stab at this. And I mean, if going back to an earlier comment that was, was made by, by uh, uh, many of the panel members, if you look at this region, 85% of the water, again, goes for food. Water parks are bad. There's no question about it. Water savings at the home level, at the domestic level, must be done. But let's look at the big picture. 
85% going to agriculture, and nobody is monitoring the water use efficiency in that sector. That needs to be a priority in my mind. And uh, is the implication of that that they shouldn't be trying to be food self-sufficient or to grow their own food I mean, here, or I just that they should do it differently? I want to go back and build on, on what Usha ma made the point yeah. about water pricing. Yeah. If I'm in food industry, and I, again, this is a very complicated issue. I'm not, I'm, not trying, I'm not naive about the complication in implementing it. But if I'm a food industry, food production, in the food production business, if I'm looking at my cost at the end of the year, water cost is negligible. There's no water cost. I'm paying for the pumping system, I'm paying for the infrastructure, but I'm not paying for water. So I would reconsider the water use efficiency if I'm being charged the fair price of water. And that's the, that's the point that, that, that I think needs to be made. So yes, water parks are, are bad, the, the, but how much they constitute? They constitute a very small percentage of our water use. So if you look at the entire sector, the, the domestic use is about 10 to 12 percent. The industrial use may be about 20 percent. The big, the big elephant in the room is the agriculture food production. And in my mind, that's what needs to be the effort. I think everybody wants to get an Usha. What's, what's your No, and point? there's other questions. So very quick, to your question, are there countries that worry about this? There are. And the way they typically do it is through pricing and through something called allocations. So Australia is a good example of this, if you want to read up on it, where they have made allocations of water to different users, and those allocations are, in fact, your limits on how much you can use. There are other countries as well. Chile has done this as well quite reasonably um, uh, successfully. Um, but price and allocation is the way that you uh, monitor uh, use of, of water or any other resource for that matter. Well, let me just say something on that, although it's not a nuclear issue, but you said about regulations in my country, apart from pricing, which is, uh, which is done, uh, municipalities have the responsibility of the water. Spain is a relatively dry country, and especially in summer, we receive millions of tourists from outside. We consume a lot of water. It's very frequent in a dry summer that the municipalities in many areas limit the use of water, for example, uh, forbidden uh, to use water for irrigation of gardens and swimming pools. This happens regularly in the country, Madrid, for example, which is the capital, and in the coast. So municipalities have uh, capacity of make uh, legislation to avoid the use of certain uses of water, and they do it. But should, should they, in fact, be going for agriculture? Because I was struck when I was in Spain by the amount of water, the amount of olive production there is, which is, you know, very water intensive. Mm. So maybe it's they're aiming at the wrong things. Uh, we are doing many, many wrong things. It's uh, very intensive in water, as here, because it's hot, so you need a lot of water for many, for many things and for the agriculture. In the Nordic countries or the middle countries of Europe, there is a lot of rain, so they don't need, don't need to irrigate a lot of things. Yeah. But uh, we are very poor in the management of water. But this is uh, becoming a concern for the government, and more and more uh, we are uh, trying to become more efficient. We were distributing water for agriculture at the open air with tremendous losses on that. Little by little, uh, there is a, a more co of a concern of the efficiency of the system. Okay. Okay. I, I, I'll see what, uh, yes, there's the woman in the front row. Don't be yes. hard on olive trees, and I'd hate to live in a world without fountains, so okay. there. <laughs> so you will, you'll speak up for olives I and fountains. I will speak and up for fountains any day, but, you know, water parks, you can always recycle the water in a water park. I mean, you've got great membranes in this country. You're very good at using them. Uh, you know, you can, re you can recycle uh, What about the point you made about the use of chemicals in the water? Does that make it harder to recycle? No. I mean, you use membranes. No. Yeah. I mean, yeah. membranes, membranes they're if they're engi engineered to the nanotech level, you, okay. can take, you can take everything out of them. Very good. There's uh, more energy. Lady, yeah, and then there's, I'll take two questions now, one from you and then one from the woman just two down from you. Um, as you mentioned, this is a water-scarce region, and... Uh, there have been many initiatives to reuse or recycle water. Uh, one of the recent things has been to pump desalinated water into underground. I'm just curious to know, is there any unintended consequences of that? I mean, it sounds like a great idea. Okay. Um, do uh, and then the, oh, the woman next to you, and then, and then we'll take both questions because we're beginning um, to run out Hello, of time. Dr. Mason Mukhayad, Associate Professor of Natural Sciences at American University in Dubai. Um, actually, legislation in this country does exist and regulation does exist that regulates grey water management and it's effectively done so that fountains of hotels and parks, etc. actually comes from reused water. Sure. Uh, in terms of crop, however, that's in any country, including this one, the majority of the use. And in that case, you can't use uh, the grey water because it has health implications. So anything that goes into crops that get eaten will have health implications. But everything else, right up to water that you use for washing in your household, can be recycled. 
And actually, the UAE, in favor of the UAE, is actually one of the leaders regionally in this particular thing. Um, Abu Dhabi, for example, has Istidama going on now, and there's a lot of regulation and monitoring. And also in uh, further urban development and new city design, this is being uh, used again. And even when they're building the infrastructure, they're considering those. So um, actually, I am proud to be in the UAE where these things are considered for the future. Well, uh, but yeah. actually, and Mazdar. And Mazdar, indeed, yeah. indeed. Um, one thing that I am interested in, um, have, has the region, I, I know it's been discussed on a GCC level, but has it been discussed on a Middle East level, um, to have shared water grids? And with the desalination, I mean, one of the interesting things is that you can desalinate. I mean, this is a, an energy-rich country, but also it's also a country looking into alternative energies. So certainly desalination can be supported as a long-term um, uh, decision or option. But the, the actual main problem with the desalination is that there are n not enough reservoirs to actually keep the water for a long period of time. So if you do have the capacity to produce the water but not keep it for a long period of time, why not share it with your neighbors who have the shortage, like the country of the gentleman in Jordan? So have things on a regional scale for sharing grids and also perhaps having a credit system where you're exchanging water for something else, so these countries who are short of water can give you something back. Well, th thank so you very much for, for, for the information about what's going on here, which is really helpful to, to have that. We've got two questions there. Who wants to t take, uh, take on which question? Uh, Luis, here, you seem well, to... I think I'll say a couple of things. Uh, regarding desalination, you have touched an important point. It's very nice, but it's very intensive in energy, and that's a problem in itself. The other problem is that uh, desalination produces salt and many other things, which if you do it in a large scale, they could become a problem of contaminating uh, land and all that. So that could be a, a caveat for that. But regarding to share water, I think this is very important because we are importing in Spain gas from Algeria. Some people say, why don't to import water from France? Because the rivers in France are tremendous. Well, you have to take into account that in terms of transportation, for the cost of the water today, the price that the water has, that is totally inefficient economically. If you have to send it long distances. So we think it's a problem there. Okay. Ravi, you look like you want to say something? Two quick comments. We need to be reconsidering the uh, groundwater recharge. Uh, so groundwater <laughs> depletion, uh, th there are many ways of checking the leakage and, and the efficiency of groundwater recharge, but that's one area that we need to explore. Uh, I, I don't think we are looking for transporting water long distance. It's a, it's a local uh, uh, issue, and storage is an issue, it's a, it's, it's a big issue. Uh, as far as the use for gray water in, uh, for agriculture, it needs to be explored. If you're eating strawberry, of course, you, 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 you have health concern. But if you have a root crop, if you have pot uh, potato or, or, or s some of the other crops that do not have, I mean, uh, the health risk is, is, a, is, is a certainly a valid point. But there are some ways uh, that, that needs to be managed. And it's quite possible that the regulations are too stringent because there's lots of places in the world that use worse than gray water in terms of direct application on agriculture, and most of them are still there. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's something you have to review on a continuing basis. As to using desal water for recharge of groundwater, which mm. uh, our friend asked about, it really depends on the geology of the area because are you putting it into a basin that'll hold it or are you simply uh, dispersing this water forever? But India is doing massive groundwater recharge. Uh, you know, the trick will be at some point to harvest the monsoons because some parts of India get all of their water in five days or, or seven or 90 percent of their way of a whole year's rainfall in about five days. And if you could harness some of that and use that for massive recharge of groundwater, uh, then it certainly obviates building a lot of new dams and it certainly uh, starts to solve some of the problems. But you know, when I give speeches on water, I say, I'm going to make you an expert on water. Repeat after me three times. Water is local, water is local, water is local. So the fact that something works in one place means that you can go and explore the idea in another place, but you can't ever assume that you could take the solution and simply move it somewhere else. But it may give you a good idea about something that you can try. So groundwater recharge, good idea, but it needs to be really looked at in the local circumstance. Usha. You asked about unintended consequences, right? So as far as I know, desalinated water is pretty high quality water. So putting it into a storage area, assuming there is one geolo uh, ge geologically speaking, I don't think it'll have a consequence on the aquifer, but the consequence is what we said earlier. 
which is the more desalination you have, you have to worry about brine uh, being discharged into the oceans where, where you're desalinating the water from. And there's already a worry about the seas around this region getting saltier uh, than other seas. So that's just one. On the larger um, issue of, I mean, well, I, see, I think both your questions were somewhat connected, but I just wanted to uh, talk about transporting water and shared water grids. It's true, water is very difficult to transport, it's, it's difficult to do, but I, just slightly pushing back on what has been said so far. You know, some years ago, gas, they said the same thing about gas, right? They said gas cannot be transported, it's too big, it's too voluminous, how on earth are you gonna transport it? What did they do? Qatar, in fact, was the one who came up with LNG. And once they came up with the conce concept of LNG, you could cryogenically transport gas in liquid form and then regasify it when it hit the shore on the other side. Now, do I have or know of such a technology for water? No, but if we truly do move into the scarce world scenario that at least we are sort of, some of us, including myself, are worrying about, then maybe there will be options on transporting water and sharing water. Today, there is none. It's very local, as Maggie said. Thank you. Well, we're, we're just about out of time. However, we did start a bit late, so with the panel's permission, perhaps if we go on for another 10 minutes, because I do see a few hands there. Um, two questions, I'll take two last questions. The gentleman there and the woman in the front row. Oh, oh, sorry, people feel oh, the back feeling neglected. Okay, I'll take three, the person over there. Uh, but the, the, you, you first, then the guy with the mic, and then the lady here. Shukran li ata'a al-majal al-sahafa, li'anani muraasilat wakalat aswat al-Iraq. لدي سؤالين السؤال الأول إلى الأستاذ مختار إلى تطرقت إلى نهر الفرات بشكل عام والعراق يعاني الآن من عدة مشاكل عويصة فإلى أي مدى هناك يعني فرص متاحة للعراق للحصول على مياه للاستخدامات المتعددة في مجال الصناعة في مياه الشرب علما أن البصرة مثلا تعاني من شحة المياه منذ سنين طويلة نعاني أيضا من حسار نهري دجلة والفرات سؤال آخر هل تعتبر أن المياه اللي تعتبرون المياه اللي تصلنا الآن في الإما في الإمارات ونحن مقيمين في الإمارات للبيوت والشقق هي مياه صالحة للشرب أم لا نحن نعاني من هذا هل نقرر شربها أم لا هل هي صالحة للشرب أم لا؟ Okay, uh, not everybody here I think speaks Arabic and will have translation. So Rabbi, could you just summarize the question and then and then perhaps answer it as well? I, yeah. I don't have the answer because oh. Oh. the question. Well, what's the question? The question is. If you correct me if I'm wrong, but the question is about is the domestic network for water use that's being provided to the household suitable for drinking? And I don't have the, I don't know the answer. Uh, but your point about the, uh, the, the, uh, the Euphrates basin uh, water level in the Euphrates is, is being depleted day by day because of the over pumping, because of the expansion of the agriculture, because of the many reasons for draining the wetlands, and, and, and there are a lot of much more politics that goes into it, which I think I'm not going to get into. Uh, th those are real problems, but they're not unique to, to, to Iraq. They're, they're, re they're global problems that over pumping uh, and illegal pumping and illegal use and non-regulated, not, I wouldn't say illegal, but non-regulated use of, of water for uh, industry and agriculture and, and whatsoever. Uh, needs to be better monitored, as uh, Maggie mentioned. Okay. But as far as the water quality in the network, I, I don't know okay, the well, uh, Thanks, then. Anyway. L last two questions. The gentleman here has got a mic. Um, my name is Thomas Ptacek, and I'm studying at the Halt International Business School. And uh, my question is more related to, you mentioned that uh, in the near future, water might uh, become transported from country to country. And uh, I would want to know what, what might be the implications, because then it basically implies that water might be becoming a commodity, which means putting a price on it. And uh, then basically the demand would be... Um, yeah. are, are we going to be selling oil, water in the yes, same way that people exactly. sell oil or gas at some point? Okay, yeah. so hold that thought for a second, and then we'll get the last question from the lady in the front row. Uh, do you have a, uh, yeah, could you just pass, pass the microphone up? I think that uh, constituents are complement this question. So I'm more on the oil and gas side, and there is two components which uh, are similar to the oil and gas. One is that you said that, in fact, the water now is exactly the same amount on Earth that uh, was before, and that's exactly the same for oil and gas. The reserve to production ratio of the world 
is 30 years, since 30 years. So, in fact, that's come with the development of technology and new sources, in fact, of, uh, of innovation. So that comes also to your point, which is that at a certain moment of time, that was the answer about gas, who were saying it's better to be used, in fact, domestically or in the neighboring countries, and now we have technological revolution, LNG, and even shale gas. So the question is, where do you see the potential water innovation or investment requirements in water innovation? And the second, is that we do not have, in fact, uh, water here in the Middle East, North Africa, but that has to be analyzed on a very um, granular way because UAE is one of the highest GDP per, of our water consumption per capita, and Jordan is not the same situation. And the agriculture is very strong in the north, but not that much here. So the regional approach sometimes can uh, blind you a little bit, and the second thing is that I think we can analyze GCC as a region in terms of uh, same characteristic. And in that context, okay, there is no water, but there is a lot of oil. And if we come back to the fundamentals, there are some barter schemes which can be interesting with if we manage to develop the transportation. So my question will be who are the key countries with whom the GCC could do barter if that was possible? Okay, thanks. Well, that's it's good to have two very future-oriented questions to, to, uh, to end up with. I'll just summarize the questions, and also, if you want to make any kind of closing remark, you, now, now's your chance. Uh, the first question is, looking, looking forward to the future, are we going to get into a world where we trade oil like any other commodity? And the uh, second question is, perhaps, but is there any room for barter, oil for water, and also technology? I mean, you know, a lot of these resource issues Sometimes people think about restriction, but then they say, well, maybe technology will save us. Could technology save us? New breakthroughs on, on this issue? Who wants, who wants to have a, a crack at those? So, shall I start? Uh, yeah, why, why don't we go, we'll proceed from you the, to the, <laughs> and the, then that end. We'll go, exactly. Usha, you start. On the, the gentleman's question on, on sharing water, I mean, so the answer is, I don't know, right? So, but if we ever get to the point of water being transportable in a sensible sort of way, then yes, there has to be some sort of value of buy and sell and so on and so forth. But here's my uh, thought back to you, which is that unlike gas, in my mind, water is a very personal thing. There's a lot of political, social considerations, emotive considerations around water. So the question is, even if technologically we can do it, how much will we really get into easy shared grids is something I don't have an answer to today. Right? To your point about uh, technology very quickly, I think innovation in water is, is, is happening already. It continues to happen all around the world. The innovation typically is in, is in a few areas. One is simply the whole treatment area. You know, what are the cheaper ways of treating water or reusing wastewater? That's one big area of technological innovation. And a second new area that's coming up has to do with the access question, which is new delivery models. How do you get water out to people? And it's maybe less so here, but in other parts of the world, it's a big deal. Um, how do you get water out to people more cheaply than the traditional network model, which is very high capital intensity? So those are the two areas that I can, I'm sure my colleagues can say, other areas as well of innovation. Right. On, on the water transport, we already are doing that. Not necessarily in, in, in a liquid form, we're doing it through commodities. You're already receiving, I mentioned earlier, 80% of the uh, Jordan water need is, is, is uh, supplied through wheats in Australia or, or coming in from the, uh, from the US, so already we're doing that. On the innovation side, I'd like, I 100% mean, agree with, with what Usha is saying, that the, it's, the, it's the social dimension which is gonna be the critical factor, changing habits, changing uh, 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 policies that, that will conserve and pre preserve that precious resource. But on the technical side, on the, I mean, which I think uh, I'll, I'll uh, uh, address that in, in very briefly. I would like to go back to the nexus. So wh where are the intersects that water meets the, the elements of the economic growth for a society? So uh, the energy, so how can we generate energy that is, is water friendly? So, so how it changed the paradigm in which innovation is, is being made and use water as the, as the center core for, 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 for economic development. 
and look at ways to produce food with, I mean, we have to face the reality that we are going to double food production the next 30 years. How is that going to happen using the same amount of water? So we need to be looking at technologies to reduce uh, water use, improve efficiency for the food sector and for the energy sector as well. Thanks. Luis, last word. Well, just to, to conclude, I think there are two thoughts uh, here. One, uh, the region is poor in water, but part of the region is uh, rich in energy. Provided you are rich in energy, you, you can transform that in water. The problem I see is in the areas where you are poor in both, in energy and, uh, and in water. The second concept is that uh, technology, yes, it can help a lot to be more efficient. Of course, there are other things which, like habits and all that, which are and pricing, which are fundamental. But technology, as you have seen in the last years, can help in many areas, and why not in water? Okay. Margaret, you started us, now you can finish. Okay. Um, both of these questions are actually about pricing, which is really interesting. Um, your, your question about, you know, doesn't this turn it into a commodity? You know, when you look at all of the world of water, the whole big watery world, only 2.5% of that is fresh water. And only 2.5% of that is available. The rest of it's in the Mackenzie River and it lo locked up in ice and in the, uh, in the groundwater. And only 7% of the 2.5% of the 2.5% is used for people's everyday needs, drinking water, personal water use. When you talk about the water being a human right or water being gift of Allah, uh, that's the water you're talking about, is that very small part of the very small part of the very small part. Because for most water users, water is a commodity. It's what makes the decision between somebody whether somebody grows sugar cane or barley. Uh, one is a highly water intensive crop, the other one isn't. Uh, it makes a difference in an industrial production. It makes a difference in, in a lot of economic ways. And the people that are using it are treating it as a commodity. It's one of the factor inputs of production, if you want to use economic jargon. And so therefore, that water should be paid for because it's one of the decisions that go into a production decision. Drinking water, the other part where human right businesses come into it, also have to be paid because the services surrounding that and the infrastructure necessary to get that to us will otherwise degrade. And so, and therefore, it really is essential that we confront the pricing issue on water or water services. Water itself, when you're talking about economic production, water services when you're talking about drinking water. The reason why there isn't much technological advance as there could be or should be in water is because it's really not priced. Uh, there's reams of good science on how to get more crop per drop, but if a farmer gets water free and the electricity free, then what's the incentive to change? Uh, there are better irrigation systems that aren't wasteful, that don't come up to the numbers Rabbi's talking about. But if you're getting your water free and if nobody's checking how much groundwater you're using, why would you change? Why would you make an innovation? So there's more science and more technology available than is used because of an inappropriate pricing system. So it isn't just about degrading infrastructure. It is really about the impact of having a free good which everybody needs but which nobody is paying for. So there is more technology. It's likely to come in the water user areas as much as in the water area. In other words, better agricultural techniques, better reuse techniques, all of the rest of it. But by heavens, it's dependent on the pricing mechanism. So, Thank, well, thank you very much indeed, Maggie. Uh, and I think it's only appropriate that, that at the World Economic Forum, you should end up by reminding us of the essential economic aspect of this whole issue of water security. I'd like to thank all of the audience for, for coming here and for asking such good questions. And I'd like to thank the panel for answering them so effectively. Thank you all very much. You've been a good audience.